to thank the audience for being here. If you weren't here, this would all be for nothing. So I'm happy to see a room full of people. Um, so I've always had an interest. Oh. So I've always had an interest in um, the law as it relates to animals, which I suspect stems from my sort of inexplicable love for dogs and cats as a child. Um, and uh, when I became a lawyer and then a professor, it was, uh, I was really excited about the fact that I could incorporate that interest into my work now. Um, so I taught a course on uh, animals and the law uh, at the law school in the fall. And uh, a lot of what I'll talk to you about tonight stems from, stems from there. Um, I'll just offer a brief caveat, which is that uh, everything that I'll talk to you about tonight is sort of my academic interpretation of um, the law as it relates to animals. I'm not a member of the Nova Scotia Bar, not yet at least. Um, so none of this, of course, is legal advice. Um, I'll also say that animal law is, uh, is an incredibly vast field. Um, and insofar as I can claim any um, expertise, so to speak, uh, I would say my expertise is more about our treatment of companion animals, um, and that's what I've sort of researched and written about so far uh, as, as, as in terms of law relating to animals. Um, although I'm very happy to answer questions about uh, other areas and subjects uh, to the best of my abilities. So what will I talk about tonight? What I tried to do with the poster um, is highlight the contradictory ways that we think about and relate to animals and how the law relates to animals. Um, so on the one hand, you know, we love animals, or many people do, and I suspect probably quite a few people in this room would agree with that. We think of them as family members. Uh, we're horrified when we hear sort of horrendous stories of cruelty in the news. We want to think that we do a good job of protecting their interests. On the other hand, we use animals every day. We eat them, we lock them up in enclosures far from their natural habitats, and pay money to go and look at them. We pay money for them to entertain us in circuses, for example, although that's happening sort of less and less in North America. In things like rodeos, which, believe it or not, happens to be a timely subject in Nova Scotia. You may have heard something about that on the news. I'll come back to it. Um, in places like zoos and aquaria, of course, places like Marineland and uh, the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, and of course, there are places closer to home as well. We use products, cosmetics, household products, medications, um, most of which have been tested on animals, and these are not usually painless procedures for the test subjects for the animals. Now, I don't plan to talk too much about animals as uh, research subjects, given the relatively short time I plan to speak for, um, but that's just another example of how uh, the law as it relates to animals does not necessarily map on to how most people think or feel that animals um, should be treated and protected. So what I want to do, using a couple of examples, is really bring this sort of contradiction to light by talking to you about uh, a couple of different uh, categories um, of our treatment of animals um, and about how the law does or does not protect them within those uh, categories or uh, in the context of certain activities. And I'll do that by talking about four categories um, specifically. Although, if there are questions about others, as I said, I'm happy to, uh, to try and answer those during the Q&A. So my plan is to talk for about uh, 40 minutes or so, and then open things up to discussion. And the four things that I plan to talk about are animals as family members, and what the law says about their status as part of our family, and uh, what happens uh, relative to animals when families break down. Um, I'll talk about federal uh, anti-cruelty laws and uh, mostly, well, in the criminal code. And I'll explain how, while it doesn't do this expressly, the criminal code uh, effectively distinguishes between different types of animals that sort of garner protection under the code. Um, I'll talk about animals and, and, in uh, entertainment, and we might think about zoos and aquaria 
um, in this category as well. So I know that there's a lot uh, of uh, a lot of talk out there about the idea that uh, some zoos are engaged in research and conservation activities, um, and that may be true in certain places, but I do think that the line between entertainment and aquaria in particular can be a blurry one. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about animal agriculture, animals that we eat or whose, or whose products uh, we eat and, um, or consume. And there I'll talk mostly about the rules around uh, transportation of farmed animals, which are, I mean, I won't lie, pretty much the worst in the developed world, um, at least from the perspective of the animal's interests. Okay, so I'll get, uh, I'll get into part one now, which is companion animals, or animals that we consider part of our families. And just to get a sense of who we're talking about, these are my companion animals. That's Rumple, a golden doodle, and Slim Jim, the domestic short-haired cat. Um, so some more context. Estimates put the number of um, Canadian households with companion animals at around 60%. In terms of dollars, Canadians spend around $8 billion a year on their household pets. And that number comes uh, from a study relied on by the uh, Canadian Veterinary, Medicine, Veterinary Association um, published a few years ago. So I think it's fairly safe to say that Canadians care about their animals. Now, that 60% doesn't take into account um, sort of marital or family status. But the fact that so many families include dogs and cats and you know, other types of pets as well, because they're so popular in Canadian families, they're going to become an issue when families break down. So when couples get divorced or split up if, uh, if they're not married. And uh, in many cases, that means that the law is going to get involved, just like it does for all kinds of family property. Because animals are, in fact, property. So in the eyes of the law, your dog or your cat or your lizard or, or bird or whatever uh, animal you share your home with, is uh, the equivalent to your couch or your fridge or your office chair. So some people here I'm sure know this, others maybe not. When people learn this, they tend to be quite surprised. I think it's off-putting to think about your dog as a thing, as garnering the same treatment as your desk. So what does this mean that animals are mere property when families split up. So the divorce rate in Canada is about 40%. We saw, or I mentioned, that about 60% of animal, uh, families include a companion animal. So it's not uh, uncommon that a dog might get caught up in a dispute between a divorcing or a separating couple. Uh, um, yeah. So, what should happen with those animals uh, when people can't work things out on their own at the time of family breakdown really depends on who you ask. Uh, because there are varied opinions on this from the legal system, so from judges more specifically, um, and most relevant for our purposes, because when things go south following a, a, a divorce or a breakup, when people argue about property and can't work things out, ultimately these disputes may end up in front of a judge. So what judges think about this, this really matters, and also what judges say is going to guide sort of negotiations in future cases. So what judges think about this uh, varies. So on the one hand, there's one end of the spectrum which represents the view that this kind of thing, determining who gets custody of a dog, uh, is a complete waste of uh, court time and resources. And I put custody in, in quotes because the term custody doesn't apply here. Animals are property. Judges don't determine who gets custody of an expensive painting or a car or anything else when a couple divorces. So the, re the, the real issue here is about determining ownership of a dog. Um, and of course, this applies to other animals as well. But most of the cases have to do with dogs, so I'll refer to dogs for the most part. Um, so this 
this end of the spectrum that thinks that this is really just a waste of time is a direct application, also represents a direct application of the principle that dogs are property and that subject to an agreement or an express sort of transfer of ownership, the general rule about property is that the person who purchased the property owns the property. That can become a little less straightforward in, uh, in the context of a divorce and family property, but at a very basic level with respect to property, owner is purchaser. So judges at this end of the spectrum with respect to animals might accompany their reasoning with statements like, dogs are not children, we don't buy and sell our children for profit, and that people shouldn't be encouraged to resort to the courts for this kind of thing, to determine ownership of a pet. And that to ask a judge to determine ownership of a dog is as silly as asking a court to make an order with respect to a particular set of cutlery, because one partner happens to be particularly attached to that cutlery or silverware. Now it's true that animals are property, and the property designation comes from uh, precedents that are centuries old, um, established when we knew a lot less about animals' capacity to feel pain and to uh, develop uh, emotional bonds the way we do now. Um, and there are people working to change that, to change the property designation, but that's a, a difficult battle and one that will probably be ongoing for a while. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that in the question period. But for present purposes, the fact remains that animals are property. What's questionable about this kind of thinking, that this is a complete waste of judicial resources and time, is that taken to its logical conclusion, that reasoning suggests that litigation over any kind of inanimate object, uh, objects like jewelry or a china cabinet, uh, also not worthy of the court's time. But the fact is, judges deal with this stuff every day, especially in family court. There's case law about jewelry, about furniture, about artwork, about property, in other words, that people have you know, an important or a particular emotional attachment to. Now, whether cases like that are, in fact, a great use of uh, judicial resources uh, is a question worth asking, and I think there are probably strong arguments on both sides there. Uh, a friend of mine practices family law in Edmonton, and I was chatting with her about this, and she told me that she spent two hours negotiating an agreement over, I don't know whether to call it custody or ownership, but about who should be responsible for and have access to a pair of bunny rabbits. So, this couple paid her and the opposing lawyer for two hours of their time to work this, to work this out. Um, now that was worked out through negotiation without going to a judge, but a lot of similar issues are not. And the fact remains that that is what courts are for, to settle disputes um, between citizens using reason and logic. So this idea that determining legal ownership of an animal is a waste of time I think is a, is a questionable approach. So that's one end of the spectrum. At the opposite end of the spectrum is uh, the opposite view, that this is in fact an important, an important question, one that's worthy of uh, judicial resources, and that it should not necessarily be determined according to straightforward property, um, to a straightforward property analysis or, or principles. And this idea has also been recognized in the case law. So cases like this don't deny that animals are in fact property, but rather they offer um, a, a reasonable recognition that animals are not the same as other kinds of property. They're not inanimate objects, they, uh, they're living beings, uh, and people have emotional attachments and relationships with them. So this approach, the not straightforward property approach, would look uh, beyond who purchased the dog. So sure, it would look at that as one factor in determining ownership, um, but it would also look at other things. So it would look at who raised the dog, uh, who exercised care and control of the animal, who had the burden of the care and comfort 
of the animal. Who paid the expenses for the animal? We, we heard Canadians spend billions of dollars on their pets, so who paid that stuff? Vet bills, training, food, etc. And these factors also recognize, interestingly I think, that ownership can change between the time that the animal was acquired and the breakdown of a family, say a couple of years later. Um, so those factors come from a, a case, uh, a small claims court uh, decision from Nova Scotia in uh, 2017. And uh, that list of factors, I haven't listed all of them, but I think those are the most interesting ones in terms of recognizing that we're talking about a relationship here. Uh, those factors were recently relied on by a judge at the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Court of Appeal um, in what I'm fairly certain was the first uh, appellate court decision to deal with the ownership of a family pet. So for those who don't know, appellate court decisions are significant. They set the law um, for that province. They're the last step that someone would go to before seeking um, leave or permission to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, which sets the law for the country as a whole. So it's neat to see an appellate court actually engage with this, uh, with this question. Animals don't get a lot of traction in the courts. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting when they do. Um, so unfortunately, those reasons relying on the sort of relational factors of pet ownership uh, didn't prevail in that case. So appellate courts typically sit in uh, panels of odd numbers and the two other judges sitting on that case applied a straightforward property analysis and um, attributed ownership of the dog to uh, one party, the, the man in the relationship who had purchased the dog, um, despite indicators that uh, the, his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend um, might have also owned the dog. Uh, but the third judge, the dissenting judge, she disagreed with the, the majority. She looked at the evidence and she found that both parties, based on their individual relationship with the dog, a Bernadoodle named Maya, um, <laughs> that both of them owned the dog together. So she would have awarded sort of joint ownership between them. So she wasn't the majority, which means that uh, the law in Newfoundland and Labrador right now is that uh, purchaser equals owner. But still what's interesting is the recognition by an appellate court judge of the importance of the relationship with the animal, even accepting that animals are property. So sort of recognizing that animals are in fact a distinct kind of property, not like a dining room table or, or a desk. So again, that reasoning didn't prevail in Newfoundland, but that doesn't mean that another court of appeal in another province wouldn't go the other way. So appellate court decisions aren't binding outside of the province in which uh, they're decided. So if and when, and I would say when, because these cases, I, I, that, that bunny case wasn't my friend's only animal case. She's worked out sort of visitation and custody agreements about a dog. So I think it's really a matter of when this gets to another court of appeal, that court might decide to go with the sort of relational factors. Not guaranteed, but certainly not uh, impossible. Um, so that case was not an actual victory for the woman who sort of lost ownership of the dog, but it's a small victory uh, nonetheless for those who believe, like I do, that animals, uh, you know, even if they are property, shouldn't be treated the same way as uh, a bedroom set. And uh, so a bit of a victory there. And to be frank, as I said, animals don't see very many victories in the legal system, so it's quite significant and, uh, and hopeful. Okay, so if you have questions about, the, uh, about this issue, about ownership or uh, animals as property more generally, happy to ask uh, to answer those during the, uh, the q and I just wanna make sure that I don't talk too long and that I get through my four sort of categories. So I will move on to um, animal cruelty. Um, which, uh, it's a bit outdated, but uh, hasn't changed much with respect to animals since far before 2007, so not uh, irrelevant. Um, so animal cruelty, which is governed um, as a general matter by the Criminal Code of Canada, which is a uniform law which applies the same way across uh, every Canadian jurisdiction or province, and which defines the offense of the criminal offense of animal cruelty. So section 445.1 of the criminal code 
is the sort of key provision dealing with cruelty to animals. And it basically tells us that people are not permitted to willfully cause unnecessary pain and suffering or injury to an animal or bird. Not sure why the code distinguishes between animal or bird. It's 150 plus years old, or just about 150 years old. I don't know what the science was like when this uh, was written. Um, also sets out uh, punishment for animal cruelty, which uh, uh, can, you know, depending on the seriousness of the offense or whether the Crown elects to proceed by indictable offense, which means that uh, it's a very serious matter. Um, maybe, you know, if it's person's, uh, if it's not their first offense, the Crown might go by indictable. Um, in that case, maximum five years in prison. Uh, or, uh, you know, if it's considered a less serious offense, they might charge by summary conviction, uh, con yeah, summary conviction, summary offense, um, for a maximum fine of $10,000 and or 18 months in prison. These were changed, I believe, in 2008. Uh, the sentences were much lower uh, before that, and they didn't change until egregious cases of animal cruelty started being reported in the news, and judges had their hands tied about what they could do about it because the, the, um, the provision, the, the uh, available punishment was so light. So you'll notice in the slide that I've bolded uh, a couple of words. And uh, the reason I've done that is because those words, willfully unnecessary, uh, are really key to understanding how this provision works or doesn't work, depending who you ask. So those bolded parts, in other words, tell us um, who uh, or which animals this provision is really meant to protect. Because I think there might be some uh, misconceptions about what the criminal code sort of does and uh, does not protect with respect to animal cruelty. Um, so in, in short, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this, but in short, the criminal code prohibits gratuitous violence toward animals. So the deliberate causing of pain and suffering unnecessarily or for no good reason. But it does not prohibit necessary pain and suffering. So it's been up to the courts to tell us precisely what that means. So some examples, and these are all from the case law, and right now I'm glad there are no small children here, because the courts have told us that skinning a cat alive, unnecessary. Beating a dog with a shovel and leaving it in a dumpster, unnecessary. Taping a dog's mouth shut, tying up its legs and leaving it in a field to die, also unnecessary. But practices related to pig slaughter, practices that cause pain and suffering with evidence that there are less painful ways available, necessary. So I'm not going to get into the details of the particular practice in question in the case that established that rule, this precedent, um, because the case was decided in 1957. And I know that slaughter practices have, of course, um, evolved since then. But the case is nevertheless a leading, a leading one, or a leading authority, on, um, on this question of necessity and what it means to cause necessary versus unnecessary suffering to an animal. So in other words, it's a fundamental case that we teach in an animal law course, for example, for the purposes of understanding um, this provision of the criminal code. Because the court's reasoning there, basically that humans have a legitimate interest in eating pigs and that therefore causing them pain and suffering is necessary, that reasoning is still good law. And it applies way beyond slaughter as well. So what the case law basically tells us about this provision is not that it protects animals from cruelty, but rather that it protects or immunizes what we deem as necessary cruelty. And what's necessary is going to depend much less on the treatment in question than about the animal's use. And that's basically a direct reading of this pig slaughter case. It's called the Pacific Meat. Because the judge there tells us that if someone were to carry out these actions on a pig for no good reason, in his words, to hear it squeal, or for any other sadistic reason, 
he says unequivocally that that person would be guilty of animal cruelty. So animal cruelty is really about use and not about the act in question. Which of course tells us something about which kinds of animals are going to be protected by the criminal code. All those first cases I listed to you were all about dogs. And when I said earlier, we don't like hearing about these egregious cases of cruelty in the news, typically they're about dogs, sometimes cats. The case that led to the sort of, I don't want to call it overhaul because it was just a very minor change to the, uh, to the uh, punishment or available sentences for animal cruelty. The case that uh, led to that was about a cat. So farmed animals and animals used in agriculture not really protected by the criminal code. It's going to be exceptionally rare, really an egregious case of cruelty outside of the realm of any accepted practice that someone involved in agriculture is going to be charged criminally under the code for animal cruelty. And this case, the Pacific Meat case, is basically why. So dogs and cats, sure, but even that is not so straightforward. So, Nova Scotia just um, effectively banned um, cat declawing. The uh, Canadian Veterinary Association has come out strongly against the practice, and Nova Scotia has been the first province in Canada to pick up on their sort of, I don't want to say recommendation, condemnation. Um, the uh, CVMA calls it uh, non-therapeutic partial digital amputation, the amputation part being key, I think. Um, because that's what declawing is. It's basically cutting off a, a cat's uh, finger at the edge of it, the end of its last, last knuckle. It's, uh, it's painful. It's unnecessary. H has, ever, has anyone ever been charged under the criminal code before the ban in Nova Scotia? I'm fairly comfortable saying no. No one has been charged under the code for cutting off the ends of a cat's fingers. So, the ban is great. Like I said, Nova Scotia is the first place to do this. I hope that other provinces uh, follow suit. It's long overdue. You talk to people, uh, often you know, people in Europe, and you talk to them about declawing, and they're like, that's crazy. What is that? Because their animal welfare laws are far more developed than ours. But this is a positive change, and hopefully it'll set a trend for the rest of the country. But I use this example to illustrate uh, the weaknesses in the criminal law. Because if someone were charged under the criminal code for causing unnecessary suffering to a cat prior to the ban or anywhere else in the country right now, they could easily demonstrate that it's not in fact unnecessary, that it's a regular thing that we do to cats. In other words, it's an accepted practice and that there is no less painful alternative. In fact, they don't really need to prove that there's no less painful alternative. In the pig case, there was a less painful alternative that other uh, slaughterhouses and I think uh, places in the United States were using, but it wasn't as cost effective and the judge said that's okay. Um, it's also not true that there's no uh, less painful alternatives to decline. There are. But uh, the point remains the same. The, uh, any criminal charges for declining would, would likely fail. So one more thing I want to say about the criminal code and the reason it's uh, not great at protecting animals' interests. So that's a fairly uh, well-fed horse, probably not the best illustration of the story that I'm about to tell you, um, which is about the interpretation of the willfulness requirement in the code. And uh, our understanding of the willfulness requirement comes from a case where someone's horses did not look like this. It's a case about the failure to feed one's horses. And basically what it tells us is that the willfulness requirement the fact that someone needs to willfully cause unnecessary pain and suffering, that needs to mean something. So the leading authority on, uh, on willfulness is a case um, out of Alberta about a man who ran a tour company in the Yukon. And he had about uh, two dozen horses as part of his, uh, his setup. And at the end of the tourist season, he brought his horses um, in November down to Alberta uh, for the winter, put them out to pasture, was told that it's a great spot and the horses will be fine. In March, so four months later, local farmers became um, concerned about the condition of the horses. They looked very skinny and uh, they called the RCMP. 
um, depending on you know where you are in the country, if it's an urban or rural place, who enforces sort of the criminal laws respecting animals varies between the police and sort of local humane societies and SPCA. So this was in uh, Grand Prairie, and the, S the uh, RCMP was uh, obviously um, mandated to, to enforce these provisions. So uh, they called the police, the RCMP showed up, and it turns out that three of the horses died of starvation, and the remaining, uh, uh, he had what a two, I don't know, 21 horses, uh, were uh, emaciated. So because of the weather, we're talking Grand Prairie in the depth of winter, uh, most of the hay and the grass available to the horses was covered in ice. So there was no controversy that the horses, you know, did in fact starve, that their owner failed to uh, provide suitable and adequate food. In other words, that they suffered unnecessarily. However, the cruelty provision of the criminal code requires that somebody act willfully. And here, there was no evidence on the record that um, the owner in question intended to let his horses starve and die. So the evidence, in other words, did not establish that he knew that leaving the horses unattended in this pasture over the winter would probably result in them going hungry. And the judge reasons that the loss of the horses would result in a serious uh, financial hit for the individual, which he obviously would not have willfully intended. Therefore, the neglect or you know, cruelty could not have been willful. And incredibly, in coming to his conclusion, the judge relies on evidence by a local vet to the effect that this kind of neglect and starvation of horses and other livestock in the area is common which led the judge to conclude that it was actually not unreasonable for the accused to uh, hold these kinds of misconceptions. So to summarize on the criminal code, the treatment in question has to be uh, unnecessary and accepted practices, even where there is a more humane alternative, will typically be understood as necessary. And the treatment has to be intentional. And all of that has to be proven, um, I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, beyond a reasonable doubt by the Crown, by the Crown prosecutor, uh, in order for the charges to succeed. Because we're in the realm of the criminal law, the burden of proof is really high, because uh, the consequences of a criminal conviction are also really high. You know, in addition to punishment, you have a criminal code, there's lots of stigma associated with that. Um, so proving that somebody willfully harmed, uh, un caused unnecessary pain and suffering to an animal is, is not an easy feat by any means. So, not a lot of great stuff happening, um, happening under the, the criminal code. And uh, where criminal charges are successful, uh, sentences are generally quite light. So I don't want to spend much time um, on sentencing. But we saw that the provision prescribes a maximum sentence of five years for the most serious cases, for the most serious offenses. And general principle in criminal law is that the maximum sentence is for the, the worst offenders. So I haven't surveyed every single case law, uh, every single case decided under this provision since uh, the punishment, the available punishment was changed about a decade ago. Um, but I'm quite confident in saying that nobody has ever gotten a five-year sentence for um, under section under the animal cruelty provision of the criminal code. I think um, two years is probably the max, and it's very rare. So one of the sort of instances I mentioned earlier, um, a man was sentenced to two years uh, plus three years probation plus a 25-year ban on owning an animal after, excuse me, after pleading guilty to taping a dog's muzzle shut, binding its legs, and leaving it in a field to die. He also um, sort of abused a position of trust. Uh, some, some friends of his had given the dog to him to turn over to the SPCA because their, their daughter was allergic. Um, so all of that led to a charge for an indictable uh, offense, and, and he pleaded guilty. And, uh, he got two years. What's really interesting about this case is certainly the sentence, but 
in the media coverage, all of the media outlets made a point about reporting that um, from the moment that he was in prison, from the time he was arrested, the accused, or the offender, he pleaded guilty, uh, had to be placed in solitary confinement for his own uh, safety and protection. You know, the idea, of course, being that uh, his crime was really egregious. The Crown called it a despicable act of depravity. But what I think is interesting about that is that people clearly care about this stuff. You know, we put sex offenders and pedophiles in, in protection for their own good because people are so sickened by their crimes. And if he was in the same kind of danger, it's because people really care about animals. But a lot of the people, I think, that, that have these strong feelings don't know quite how little the law actually does to protect the same animals because really this was uh, an exceptional case. Okay, so that's the criminal code, which is a federal law. Provinces also have um, animal protection legislation. Uh, I won't go into any detail on it. I'll probably refer to it, or I will refer to it a little bit um, in, in a couple of minutes, and I can answer questions on it during the Q&A. Um, but what I will say is that the provincial laws generally have the same kinds of exceptions built into them, and often more expressly than the criminal code, which doesn't really say that much. Okay. So I want to move on to um, captivity and uh, entertainment. And there's really um, so much to say about this, but I'm going to limit my remarks to one um, particular type of animal entertainment because, like I said, it's actually uh, quite timely in Nova Scotia these days, believe it or not, and that's rodeo-related events. So that is a very scared calf, a baby, hogtied and being pulled across the ring by, uh, by its neck. At least I assume that he's scared and uncomfortable because of the look in his eye. I don't know how closely you can see it, but um, he looks quite fearful and, uh, and probably in pain. Um, this image, I think, says quite a bit about uh, the animals that entertain us. Um, the photo is by an animal activist photographer, Joanne MacArthur. She has a number of books um, documenting sort of captive animals and our treatment of animals. Um, so this is a, a calf roping event, again, in the context of a rodeo. And the reason that I thought rodeo was a good example uh, to use tonight of animals in entertainment um, is because you may or may not have heard there is a professional bull riding event coming to Halifax in May. Um, also an event that typically is held in the context of, uh, of a rodeo, like the Calgary Stampede. There's also a petition uh, circulating online for, I guess it's directed toward uh, the Scotiabank Centre to, to not host the rodeo, but uh, so far it's on. Um, so, sorry, not the rodeo, it's not, it's not a full rodeo, it's just the bull riding event. Um, so as I understand bull riding, the uh, contest, or the sport, is to see which rider can stay on a bucking bull the longest. And in order to get the bull to buck, they fit the bull with what's called a, a flank strap, um, which is like a tight belt fastened sort of just in front of its you know, just in front of its hind legs, like in the equivalent of our, our groin. And uh, some people are of the view that this is painful for the bull, that the strap irritates them and then causes them to buck trying to get it off, which is not an unreasonable conclusion, I think, because that's the point in putting the strap on them in the first place. Other people say um, it's more of a tickle. Um, Bull riding events are also often associated with the use of cattle prods um, and generally abusive conditions that the animals are kept in. There's no evidence of that in this case, but that's generally where the resistance seems to come from, in addition to just using the animals this way. Um, for others opposed to this kind of event, it's more about the imagery. Again, the use of animals for our entertainment and the idea that uh, it's our right to sort of overpower animals for sport, for fun. But uh, bull riding is not the most controversial um, rodeo sport. It's certainly not safe for human or animal. But things like calf roping 
and uh, chuck wagon racing, which I believe is the sort of banner event at the Calgary Stampede, those are more problematic for animals. Clearer, it's, uh, it's clearer in those cases that animals do in fact experience pain and suffering. Calf roping is what's in that image. So it's an event where a rider sort of runs into a ring, mounted on a horse, um, and is timed for how long um, it takes for them to uh, catch a running calf using a rope or a lariat, dismount uh, by its neck, dismount from their horse, run over the calf, tie at least uh, three of its legs together. That's not going to be happening in Halifax next month. But uh, another reason that this is a sort of timely discussion to be having, um, and this news I'm about to tell you uh, is not local, but it's highly topical in the world of animal law, Last summer, as part of Montreal's uh, 375th birthday celebrations, the city hosted a rodeo, which um, a lot of people thought was strange because, you know, Montreal's not Calgary. There's no history of sort of Western culture or cowboy culture or anything like that there. Um, when it was announced, a lawyer, a uh, law prof uh, at the University of Montreal, together with a group of students, they went to court and they asked uh, the court to issue an injunction against the rodeo. Um, an injunction is basically when the court tells an individual or a group, you must do something or you must stop doing something. So here, the group was asking the court to uh, stop the rodeo because according to uh, the group, uh, the group requesting the injunction, um, activities like this contravene the province's animal protection law. So the case resulted in a bit of a compromise. As a result of the, the action, the, uh, an advisory committee on the safety of rodeos was established uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture in Quebec. And as part of the committee, the professor in question, a man by the name of uh, Alain Roy, was given permission to, um, to convene a group of, of experts, including a vet and uh, an animal behavior specialist, to observe the rodeo and then report to the committee. And this would apply not only to the Montreal Rodeo, uh, which was a one-off, but uh, also to an annual event held uh, in a small town about three hours outside of, uh, outside of Montreal called St. Tit. And um, that event brings a massive amount of tourism and uh, millions of dollars to a quite small town. So it's fairly important to the uh, economy in that place. Now, the reason that this is a newsworthy story today is because the report of the uh, sort of expert committee um, came out last week and was submitted to the uh, committee uh, at the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, that photo was taken during one of the events observed. I'm not sure if that's Montreal or the smaller one. Um, they also released a series of videos uh, they're the kinds of videos that when they come up in your Facebook feed, they're grayed out and you have to actively consent to look at them because they might contain uh, violence or graphic images. And um, they're very unpleasant to watch. They show horses falling over, tripping over their feet and not being able to get back up. Horses sort of running into walls, um, bulls trying to escape from their holding pens before, uh, before their events. They show um, calves having their necks twisted in the context of this event because the competitors in a calf roping event are racing against the clock, so they're not being gentle with the animals. Um, so the gist of the report is that all of these events, or during all of these events, animals undergo what they term real, probable, and potential physical injuries at alarming rates not to mention the fear and pain that animals experience during these events. And those are not my words. That's a quote from a veterinarian who watched the footage, um, the past president of the Society for Veterinary Medical Ethics. And there are a number of other passages like that in the report and uh, surrounding documentation. So basically what the report concludes is that in allowing these kinds of events to go forward, um, Quebec is actually in breach of its own um, animal welfare law, which prohibits abuse and mistreatment of animals that may cause, um, that may affect the health of animals or expose them to distress. And as I mentioned earlier, 
most provinces, I think it's nine out of 10 provinces, have uh, a similar law in place, um, although they vary in sort of scope and applicability. So I've been going on a little bit about rodeos and, and calf roping. Um, and calf roping is particularly uh, egregious. But the reason I've spent time on this is because the fact is none of this is illegal. So virtually any practice, sort of institutionalized practice, uh, dealing with captive animals, whether that's horses or elephants or dolphins and killer whales, um, the activities that involve these animals, whether they're, uh, whether they're forced to perform or whether they're simply placed in an enclosure, um, they're all perfectly legal. None of them are captured by either the criminal code or the provincial prohibitions on causing an animal to be um, in distress. Or if they are, we don't know about it because the people that carry out these activities are never charged. So. We may or may not agree on the ethics of zoos and aquaria, but we can probably all agree that things like calf roping are not necessary. Things like keeping a killer whale in a tank maybe three times its, the size of its body when you know its natural habitat is all of the ocean, not necessary. Perfectly legal today in Canada. Keeping a, a lone elephant um, at an Edmonton Zoo in the cold, isolated from other elephants, also legal. Even in the face, that, in the face of evidence that uh, elephants, and female elephants in particular, are social in nature and should be around other elephants for their well-being. Um, as well as evidence of uh, physical distress as a result of being kept uh, indoors in a concrete pen for uh, many months uh, of many years. Um, in Edmonton, an elephant certain, certainly can't roam outdoors most of the year. They're from hot places. Um, and here I'm referring to another actual case, a case called Reese v. Edmonton out of uh, the Alberta Court of Appeal about an elephant named Lucy at uh, the Edmonton Zoo. And I'm happy to talk more about her during the Q&A as well. Now, okay, the aquarium situation um, in Canada might change quite soon. There's a bill in the House of Commons and also a bill in the Senate, um, both aimed at limiting uh, marine mammal captivity. The Senate bill is a bit better. It criminalizes uh, not just captivity, but captive breeding and performance and uh, the importation of cetaceans, so marine mammals like uh, whales and dolphins. The, uh, the bill in the House of Commons has less teeth. It doesn't really do um, too much more than what we already do in Canada, which is not live capture. Um, it's not prohibited right now, but you need a permit, and the Minister of Fisheries doesn't generally issue those permits. They haven't for decades. Um, and the, the House bill is the one that's likely to pass. The Senate bill is moving, but it's uh, also experiencing a lot of uh, resistance. Uh, lots of opposition to it. So we'll see what happens with that. Okay. The last thing I want to mention before I open things up uh, to Q&A is one aspect of the Canadian agricultural industry that's um, particularly troubling or problematic. Um, and I can talk more about the laws around agriculture and farming if there are questions about that. Uh, but the fact is, as some of you will know, there really is not much in the way of law dealing with the treatment of farmed animals on the farm, at least insofar as the law is geared toward their well-being. Some people might disagree with that, but that's my reading and understanding of the law. Um, there's lots of regulation about food safety, some of which happens to coincide with animal interests, but where the treatment of animals on farms is concerned, um, instead of legislation, there is a series of voluntary codes of practice developed uh, for the most part by industry stakeholders. Um, and there's no real enforcement mechanism there. So industry stakeholders make up a group called the National Farm Animal Care Council. They, they uh, publish these voluntary codes of conduct. Um, so in other words, when it comes to the life of the animal while it's on the farm, the law does very little. Um, it's the industry that decides, that decides the rules. What I can tell you about farmed animals, and this is the last, the last subject that I'll 
talk about before, uh, before I'm open to questions um, is uh, about animal transport. This is one thing that is expressly regulated by, uh, by legislation. Um, and as I said earlier, basically Canada has the worst animal transport laws in um, the developed world. The current regulations around transport have been around since the 1970s. They haven't changed. Um, this chart, courtesy of the Globe and Mail, um, sets out maximum transport times that an animal can be moved without uh, food, water, rest, or shelter. So for uh, baby chicks, 72 hours. Uh, for cattle, right now it's 52 hours. So two, two full days and some change. And for uh, chickens and pigs as well, it's uh, 36 hours. What these images um, don't tell us is that the temperatures at which animals can be transported are, um, for these long amounts of time, are not regulated at all, which is significant in a place like Canada with the sort of really extreme temperatures that we have. So something like minus 10 plus a wind chill going 100 kilometers an hour on a truck with a, you know, an open trailer, it's going to be pretty uncomfortable for 36 hours. Um, so the CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, has been working on updating these rules for about a decade now with the aim of ensuring that uh, Canada's regulations um, are modern, that they align with international standards, and uh, that they're supported by uh, the best science. In 2013, the CFIA established a plan to drastically decrease the maximum times. So those are the blue dots were proposed five years ago. Um, in March 2017, which this article is related to, the Globe reported that uh, the CFIA, in response to industry pressure, um, concerns about economic impacts, revised those uh, shorter periods and proposed uh, new times, the proposed 2016, the yellow one. So back up to 72 hours for chicks and then a uh, you know, a medium time for other animals. Um, nothing has changed since then. We're still at the original current regulations. But just to give you some context, in the US, the general rule for cattle is uh, 28 hours, after which an animal must be unloaded, given food and water, and allowed to rest. In Europe, it's eight hours maximum for cattle. Don't quote me on this, but I think it might be eight hours maximum for any animal in Europe, subject to, um, subject to them being transported in a truck that is fitted to provide water and is uh, insulated and properly ventilated. We don't require any of that. Um, rest times. In uh, Australia, rest times are somewhere between 12 and 36 hours, depending on uh, the species. In Europe, uh, 24 hours rest for any kind of animal. Um, in Canada, five hours rest. So you can have uh, cows on a truck standing in the cold for 52 hours, unload them, which takes time and energy, have them stand around for five hours, load them back up on the truck. So some people say that the science is a little bit divided on this, um, on the question of stress and behavioral changes associated with uh, long transport times. But frankly, the science is, unlike some of these other issues that can be debated, the science is not that divided. Uh, mostly there's consensus, even among uh, industry actors, that Canada's times are just way too long. There's also a strong consensus around, um, among Canadians generally, ordinary citizens. So according to data published um, earlier this year, Eight out of 10 Canadians are in favor of updating uh, transport laws, regulations, to uh, ensure shorter times and um, reduce suffering and protect animals from uh, extreme weather. Now, I'm not a scientist, and I certainly can't speak to the science, but what I can tell you is that according to the CFIA itself, two to three million animals in Canada die during transport every year and approximately 
Seven million more are condemned upon arrival at slaughterhouses for being too diseased or injured to be fit for human consumption. So that's almost 10 million uh, dead or condemned animals each year. And I actually have a number about how many animals we're talking about. In Canada, we kill at least 700 million animals per food, uh, for food per year. So maybe that 10 million, not that much. I don't know. Um, that's, uh, those numbers, by the way, are at uh, federally inspected slaughterhouses only. So federal institutions only deal with meat that's going to cross provincial borders. There are provincial slaughterhouses as well, although they're less and less in number, which is one of the reasons that animals in Canada spend such a long time on trucks is because provincial slaughterhouses tend to be shutting down. The federal ones are in operation and animals need to move long distances. So at present, none of these changes have been made. Um, these were published in 2016, uh, either 2013, and I, the new ones were published in 2016, and the Gazette One, which is sort of the government's announcement uh, of regulations to come, um, then they solicit feedback and uh, decide whether to amend regulations before publishing them in the Gazette Two, which is when they effectively become law. Um, so if you're concerned as a member of the public, as someone involved in the agricultural industry uh, or practice, now is the time to express your concern to uh, the federal government um, about these numbers. Okay. I've spoken um, for much longer than I had planned, and uh, I've barely scratched the surface of issues relating to animals and the law. Um, but I think I managed to get my main uh, message across, which is that when it comes to balancing the interests of humans and animals, the balance right now tips way too far in favor of humans. The law does very little to protect animals, despite our sort of professed and, and sincere love and you know, the fact that a lot of us care about animals, which means that ultimately the responsibility uh, needs to fall on us as citizens and as users of animals, whether that's as pets or for food or for entertainment or what have you. So on that note, I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can. Thank you. It always takes a while for someone to raise their hand. Uh, just a quick question. What is the rationale behind having uh, such short times for chickens versus having much, much longer times for baby chickens? I don't know. I, and, and if people in the audience know the answers to some of these questions, because I'm not an agriculturalist, I'm not a scientist, then uh, people should feel free to, uh, to, to chime in. But I don't know. Yeah. Um, Professor, you mentioned earlier about the um, uh, preventing unnecessary suffering of animals, and the standards for personal pets appear to be much higher than for livestock. And so, if I were going to go to a pig farm and purchase a piglet and bring it home and raise it as a household pet, which standard would apply to me? That's a really good question. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, um, in BC, uh, the SPCA uh, seized a bunch of potbelly pigs from a farm. Um, potbelly pigs are not really raised for eating, they're, they're pets, they're small. Um, and there was one pig uh, named Molly who was adopted. Uh, you know, you have to sign a contract saying, you know, it would be good to the pig, this and that, but you're transferring ownership, so owners of the animals can do whatever they want. Um, Molly's new owners determined that they were not capable of properly looking after a pig, so they shot her, they cut her up, they ate her, and they Snapchatted it. And they were not sanctioned whatsoever. So you raise an interesting question. The reason they weren't sanctioned is because they didn't cause unnecessary suffering. They didn't torture her, they didn't do some of the things I mentioned earlier. They shot her, painless death and they ate her, and that's their prerogative, because they're her owners. I mean, if you torture your piglet, you'll probably be in trouble. But uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I'm kind of glad that you brought that up, yeah. Isn't it true that uh, what happened to Molly would also be legal to happen to a dog or a cat as well? 
It wasn't illegal. Yeah, because I'm saying it would also be legal to also uh, kill and eat your dog if it was a piece of that. Yep. 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 Um, so some amount of the uh, framing from the legal sense with these um, animal protections guidelines and stuff is more or less along the same lines as we see um, develop within well, a lot of it's sort of like the same kind of guidelines we see with environmental productions and stuff, mm -hmm. um, where, um, and especially in agricultural senses, um, it's emphasizing this idea of best practices and that you would become compared among your um, peers and what you guys, you also have defined as like, hey, what is best practices for this kind of very specific type of operation? Um, there's some amount of that that is shaping and being perhaps more actively pursued. But um, I guess my question is like, do you think that um, you're critical of that, that kind of an idea for literally animal welfare aspects and stuff, but do you think that that is an appropriate structure for your, um, just environmental stuff more generally? Um, or that like the best practices guidelines and framework uh, needs to perhaps not be as emphasized as it is in, within a Canadian sense it should be a little bit more strongly followed up on like it is in um, I guess European context so the US is a bit of a mixed bag in, in some of those regards. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I don't have any expertise in environmental law, so I can't speak specifically to that. But my answer to that, and I have thought a lot about uh, non-legislated rules and guidelines. My my PhD research is about that in family law, and uh, for me, I'm okay with uh, non-legislated rules. Quite frankly, the government doesn't move very quickly in any area of law, and it's often going to be. Um, you know, the most interested parties who are going to come up with uh, sort of the, the rules of the game. For me, what matters is the process of creation and the people and the voices involved in the creation of those rules. I don't know who is drafting or coming up with environmental guidelines, but my issue with the, uh, the Farm Animal uh, Care Council is the voices that are that have a seat at the table. So if you go on their website and you you look at you know who's a member and who's a partner, I don't really know what the distinguish distinction is between member and partner, but it's producers, so Canadian it's egg not farmers. Only producers, pardon? No, it's not and only producers. I know. Society, and I'm, all I'm getting there. And uh, consumers, so uh, large corporations. And humane societies. So the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies is on that uh, is on that list. They're not a. I mean, this is where the conversation becomes difficult in terms of sort of meeting in the middle. The CFHS is not a is not an animal rights organization. They're an animal welfare organization, and I can't speak for them, but I suspect that they make concessions in order to maintain their seat at the table. Um, I've never been at one of these meetings, but uh, for animal advocates and people who spend their time thinking about these things from the perspective of the animal, the CFHS is not, um, they're not an animal rights group. That's, there's no animal rights groups on there. Of course. But there's going to be veterinarians, there's, there's two welfare, but, um, there, there's not just producer I know. And I've been on dozens of those and you're right, there are no animal care, well, the animal rights groups are not there because they would say, we have nothing in common, there's nothing for us to discuss. Animals are separate nations, you know, treated with lives and encumbered by our interference. <coughs> At that point, what is the there is no point? That's what I mean, there, you know, it's, it's impossible to meet in the middle. But I also think that if, you know, and I can't speak for the CFHS, but I think that if organizations and welfare organizations were to take uh, a firmer approach or lean more towards animal rights, they wouldn't be invited. So. They have yeah. to walk a line, though. You know, they do. There are veterinarians and scientists there and others. So it's not perfect, but it's. So again, you know, my issue with uh, the, the codes is, you know, like I said, I'm not a scientist and I don't know what's best for a farmed animal in terms of enclosures. I mean, I know battery cages are being phased out or have been and sow crates, etc. 
My issue is more with the idea that the, the, for the most part, the users and the people who stand to benefit from the rules are also creating the rules. And I think from a rule of law perspective, that might be problematic. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jordan, for your remarks. Um, I was at Food and Law Conference last year, the first one held at Dell. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering what you're noticing in the practice of law, what appetite there is for addressing animal well-being, and what movement in law discourse are we hearing around possibilities around the rights of animals and or rights of humans? And is that um, balancing any more than you're seeing? Today you're telling us that there's a great imbalance, humans dictate largely what happens. Um, is, is there a movement that we're seeing in law or in discourse? Uh, there is, certainly. Um, things today, you know, what I said about you know, a, a, a loss at the Newfoundland and Labrador Court of Appeal being a victory, that's true. Um, so these things are getting more public attention, more media coverage, and the law is slowly changing. Um, there's a group in, a, in Canada called Animal Justice. They're animal, animal rights lawyers. Um, they've been around for 10 years now. They have intervened in cases at the Supreme Court of Canada. They're getting traction, they're being listened to, they're often interviewed whenever, you know, like the Molly case, the, the, the uh, executive director of animal justice would have gone on, on the news about that. Um, so certainly there's an appetite for it. I think that, you know, some people say animal law is like the new uh, environmental law. You know, I mean, it's gonna take a while, but, uh, but change will happen. And I think, and I hope that, that that's true, but I think that the interests in the counterbalance are, are strong, and I think that it's gonna take longer than, than we've seen for other areas. Yeah. Yep. We're seeing quite a change in our Canadian culture uh, with increased immigration, people coming in with different backgrounds, different dietary needs, different expectations. Is that coming up at all? In Cases. You mean animal cruelty cases? Well, animal cruelty, animal use, animal abatement, something like that, animal transport. You know, if you have muscle law that protects oh, it, okay. you know, they have to allow killing, yes, and so on. Uh, how do you just, how is all of that justified and put together that if there's a particular group of people who feels very, very strongly for cultural and religious reasons that something should happen? And, that, and then, of course, we have other groups of people that, for their own cultural and religious reasons, uh, well, as a general matter, Canada has allowed halal and kosher slaughter for years and years before um, the current sort of wave of immigration. Um, we have freedom of religion in Canada. You know, it's a fundamental freedom under the Charter. So certainly if someone were to challenge uh, an ability or an inability to do something based on their religion, and the counterweight was animal interests, I suspect that the individual, the human, would win. Um, do, I, I don't know, you know uh, the ethnicity of, of offenders in the criminal law cases. Uh, I, that's, I don't think anybody sort of tracked that. But uh, Canada prides itself on multiculturalism and being a multi-ethnic state, and if those concerns were raised, then they would certainly get traction from the courts and the government. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, they had that animal auction at the end of Sam River Road, and they have animals going through there all the time, and like to get them to move around, they're like hitting them in the face and stuff. Do you think there's any time that's going to change, or is that going to be something that's going to be around for a while? I would like to see that change. Um, I, again, I think that 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 needs to come from within, you know, as we heard about being judged by your peers, because I, I can't see an SPCA investigator going to one of these auctions and laying charges because somebody, you know, prods an animal in their face. Maybe they should. You know, the Pacific Meat case is, uh, I, I, it, the province escapes me right now, but it's a provincial court case. It's not a court of appeal. It's not the Supreme Court. And that's the, our, our precedent, our interpretation of the criminal code and unnecessary comes from a, a sort of a low court years and years ago. 
So, you know, maybe that case is wrong and maybe, uh, maybe it would be decided differently today, but the fact is nobody's gonna press charges. So we, we don't know what the law would look like if, if the criminal code had to be interpreted today for the first time. Yeah. So I'm interested in, in our future lawyers that are being trained in Canada. You mentioned that you teach a course along some of this. Is it a required course for all <laughs> lawyers? And it's second part of my question for those that do take the course, if it's not a required course, what's their general reaction? Uh, it is not a required course. It is a, an optional seminar course with a maximum enrollment of 15. Last fall I had eight. I'm hoping to have at least eight again next year. But I do think that there is a strong voice among the students at the Schulich Law School to, to have that class, and I'm really happy that I get to give it. The general reaction, well, students self-select you know, to take that class, but they're not all sort of vegetarians or, or vegans or, or animal activists, and I think most of them are actually quite horrified when they hear that the law basically does not much to, to help animals. Um, some are not surprised, some are disheartened, some, um, you know, I had a student say to me, you know, this is all terrible, but at the same time, it's like a, it's like a clean slate. I can go out and do this work, and there's so much work to be done. So in that sense, I guess, some feel motivated. Yeah. Yes? I'm just wondering, is there, was there any legal significance for the woman in Toronto that was watering pigs that got charged for interference? Uh, yeah. I can't remember, Anita something. Anita Crane? Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there's a group, uh, Toronto Pig Save, they have them all over uh, the save movement all over the country, people who uh, protest at uh, sort of street corners where slaughterhouse, uh, where trucks turn into slaughterhouses and um, they documented and they, they showed, you know, posted footage on social media so people know what, this, what these practices look like. And a woman in Toronto uh, gave water to a thirsty pig, it was like 40 degrees out and she could see that the pig was panting and thirsty, foaming, um, so she gave it some water got into a bit of a heated discussion, heated discussion, um, <laughs> argument with uh, the driver, and uh, they ended up pressing charges against her for uh, trespassing on property, the property being the pigs. And uh, it was a really interesting trial. Uh, they, their, the defense brought in um, experts in uh, animal behavior. Um, uh, Anita, who is an activist, testified. Uh, Dr. Lori Marino, who is a sort of really well-known um, biologist who, who uh, is working on opening a, a whale sanctuary at the moment. She testified on uh, pig behavior. Anyway, um, there was a lot of hope that uh, her goal was to, to be convicted, to be a martyr. You know, she compared herself to Nelson Mandela and Gandhi for civil disobedience. and. Uh, and she was actually acquitted because uh, it was found that you know feeding a pig, she was charged with mischief, is, uh, is not actually mischief. And the judge ended up, so that was great for her and people were saying, you know, great, cruelty is not, uh, or kindness is, is, not, uh, is not mischief. But people were actually quite disappointed with the decision because the judge who seemed really interested um, during the trial and hearing all these experts, he really diminished uh, the importance of that testimony in, in the reasons and really just dismissed uh, all of the evidence about uh, the sentience of, and intelligence of, of pigs. And you know, um, there was evidence about, uh, about the health impacts of eating pork and meat and, and all of that uh, from doctors and nutritionists. And it was a really interesting case. But uh, she won her case, so the legal significance of that is that feeding a pig uh, in a trailer is not a crime. Um, but it's actually not a victory because the judge dismissed all the, you know, wasn't interested in, in the evidence. Yes? Given that the law doesn't seem to be able to protect animals very much, and given that the codes of practice that you were rather dismissive of do seem to have done a lot to improve the husband Would we not be better off to just rely on voluntary practices by individuals who agree mutually that this is the way to go and shame the ones who don't agree and forget about the law totally? I mean, yeah, and I, I sympathize with that argument. I, I do. 
But the, what happens is that the codes, from my understanding, when it comes to the law, end up functioning as a defense to cruelty. So I'm not saying that the content of the codes um, are understood as cruel, but if someone does engage in a particularly cruel practice, the way the law understands the codes is, a def is as a defense to what some, might, what some might deem cruel behavior. And I know that the codes are changing. I know that there have been. Do you the codes? So someone might say in defense, well, this is allowed under the code. Therefore, it's fine. It's an accepted practice. And they'll likely be acquitted because of that. Because it wouldn't be cruel. Well, I mean, who, who determines what's cruel? The committee. The committee that wrote the code. The committee that engages in the practices. So that's my issue with it. Yes, the stakeholders. Yeah. But we're all stakeholders. We are all stakeholders. We're not all stakeholders. Too many people talking. We collectively share responsibility for the public good, and conduct and treatment of animals affects conduct elsewhere in our lives. So it's not an isolated, separate from other ways of choosing how we make society together. True, but I think my complaint is more about the current code of law, which relies on, to some of us, it appears anyway, a rather archaic, outdated um, code of practice. Absolutely. Be looking at perhaps other ways. Some, of, some <coughs> provinces, in their provincial laws respecting agriculture, incorporate the codes as law. Nova Scotia, as far as I can uncover, does not. It, Nova Scotia does not make it easy to, to, uh, uh, to find the legislation. If you go on the Nova Scotia Ministry of Agriculture website, they say farms and agriculture are governed by the Animal Protection Act and the Criminal Code. The Criminal Code, obviously not. The Animal Protection Act, no. It's, uh, there's an exception in the Animal Protection Act that says that inspector uh, powers under that act don't apply to, to farms. So it, it's very difficult to, to figure that out um, in Nova Scotia. Uh, if provinces, it's, it's better than nothing to have provinces incorporate those codes, absolutely. But the problem is that not all of them do. So that alone might make a difference just in terms of the symbolic meaning of the law. You know, if something is law, you're going to take it seriously, you're going to follow it. Um, so there's no push in Nova Scotia not to my knowledge, I don't know. Maybe that's the first step. Could be. Could yeah. I speak to that actually? Mm -hmm. uh, I am a environmental welfare inspector, so I'm a bit familiar with the law. I'm not sure. aware from my formal background is agriculture, not law. So, yeah. you know, I'm hoping for a discussion. Not an absolute here. In Nova Scotia, we do have the Animal Protection Act. The codes are not written into that act as law. We rely, as inspectors, we rely heavily on those codes mm -hmm. because you have to give an opportunity for the animal owner to know what your standard you are measuring them against. And although those codes may not be perfect, they are science-based is my understanding, not emotion-driven. And although they may not be perfect, they are what we have. If you write them into the act, my understanding is that if you violate any section of the code, you are automatically guilty. That may work in some cases, but when we are also asking for and encouraging small farms to become, or there's, we're encouraging small farmers, um, is it reasonable to, for them to have a $10,000 handling shoot at a scale? Not really. But in, in the code for beef, you're required to have a handling shoot. So you have got to have some give and take in there and some sort of rationale as to why you'd want the codes written right in there. And so when we use those codes as an educational piece and we give them out at almost every single inspection, we, we give out that applicable code. And so they become valuable if we go to court because I have seen crimes refer to those and I'm not seeing, the, well, I have seen the defense use those but inevitably, the crimes that we've dealt with use them as a reason why the person isn't the accused, isn't meeting the standard, and therefore they're guilty under the act. And that is the benchmark. Whether it's the right benchmark or not, that's all that we have. And if they are science-based, 
and if they are um, reviewed and refreshed periodically, and it's never going to be enough or soon enough, then you know that that's all we can do with it. It's ever changing. Those benchmarks ever change. I mean. When I graduated, I had Deanne Tarrier as, as professors. When we, when they taught us, the practices that we had then have changed dramatically in 25 and 30 years. And now in 25 and 30 years, what I've done would probably be, I'd be convicted under the criminal code, you know? It changes that quickly. And so I think, as a society, we have to be aware of that. But I think also, and a bigger part of this, is we can't let the emotions around what we think should be done govern what we actually do. Because there's nothing more dramatic than the emotions around the companion animals and horses versus what's defined as farm animals in the Animal Protection Act. And I think emotion drives a lot of what is happening in the news. And I'm not saying everything is right or wrong in the news, but we just really need to think it through and think about what does the animal need from a biological standpoint. And to answer the man's question down in the pleasure about his pet pig in Nova Scotia, that would be defined as a farm animal. There's a definition of farm animals in the Animal Protection Act. And a pig is a farm animal. And so I, 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 there's a lot going on. And even in the room, you can sense that there's different sort of perspectives and understanding, which makes for a good discussion. Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to respond to that, actually. Um, I was actually in. Under the criminal code, if it was a dog or a cat, they'd be in trouble. But there's a whole different set of emotions and expectations around the care of farm animals. That the companion animals, they're, they're way above in terms of what people expect them to They're do. the 1%. Yeah. You know, people laugh, but it's true. Um, whether that's right or not is, is a different question, and one that we're certainly not going to agree on. Uh, but, you know, this actually, I'm going to come to the question really highlights my, my thinking about this sort of contradictory ways that we think and feel about animals. You know, certain animals cute, we cuddle them, we you know, sleep with them in our beds. Others, 
Not at all, even though you know, I'm not a scientist, but some of the differences between these animals are not you know, that serious between a, a dog and a pig, for example, in terms of pig intelligence and behavior and that kind of thing and ability to create bonds. You had a question. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, because I've read about this uh, mostly in the context of some um, uh, well, American animal and bioethicists and stuff, uh, but do you have any comments or thoughts on, uh, I guess, mammalian and corgate bias in every Canadian law? Like, how entrenched is that bias in, in for both mammals and for corgates in comparison to, you know, just stuff that are animals that don't have those properties. Uh, and is there any specific cases which are which have note in that context? There probably isn't a huge amount of case law in that. I mean, my sense is, and maybe that's why the criminal code distinguishes between animals and, and birds, because yeah. maybe certain laws don't apply to birds, but, uh, you know, uh, already the, the law doesn't do very well for all mammals. So, uh, no, I mean, I don't know of any case law, okay. you know, dealing with different uh, Geni genus, geni? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We now have uh, changes made to our Canadian Council of Animal Care guidelines and so on. So we now include fin fish in the same regulations or same regulations that we do. We used to keep men What are we going to see officers there? Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's something I want to talk about in Nova Scotia, but um, <laughs> some countries, uh, it's been in the news, uh, some Scandinavian countries have recently um, banned uh, live boiling of lobsters. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I can't see into the future, but I, I, I can't see um, something like lobsters uh, I, I don't know, you know? I mean, maybe we should ask the people who, who have been involved in, in writing the codes, because they'll know more than, than I would in terms of, you know, what's coming and the discussions that are, that are underway. But lobsters is uh, an interesting subject, for sure. I know that the science on that is very divided in terms of what kinds of, um, what they experience when they're boiled alive. Uh, but I know live boiling is probably not the only issue. I mean, the way they're captured and, and housed and transported and all of that is probably problematic as well. They're not fed in, in these tanks and grocery stores, right? Um, they, they can't move because their, their claws are banded together. Uh, but I, I don't know, you know, when they'll be subject of uh, animal welfare law. I think in lobsters, um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Nova Scotia defines animals as any non-human vertebrate. Yeah. And lobsters are invertebrates, so they probably wouldn't come under it, wouldn't they? Well, under the, the provincial law, yeah. they're, no, they're not covered. Yeah, I mean, it would be problematic if, if they were, considering how we, how we uh, store and, uh, and cook them. Yeah. Hey, just one little question. You mentioned that uh, Quebec put together an expert committee to investigate the as of rodeos. What was the conclusion of that committee? You didn't say. Well, the, uh, I don't. There's the report that was just that from the observers of the rodeos, and that report that I quoted a little bit from was just submitted to the the committee at the government level, like last week. It hasn't been a final report. No. There's more than one report. One from that that group. No, the the I'll clarify. No, there's just been the one report from the from, them. from the observers. From the observers, but the other there's another group. Of in Quebec? Yes. On that. Okay. Which would basically that. I see. Um, well, that's news to me. I haven't heard about, about the other report. Uh, but what's happened at the ministry level, um, nothing yet because they've just seen the report. The thing is, uh, in the smaller community that hosts an annual rodeo, the numbers are really staggering in terms of uh, how much money it brings in every year for a very small town. Um, so I uh, would be hard pressed to believe that the Quebec government is gonna is gonna outlaw rodeo. Maybe certain practices. Maybe they'll require sort of better standards or um, rules for welfare. Um, 
And I, I would love to be wrong, but I can't see them banning those practices completely. Is there any problems in Canada that have outlawed roads? No. Not to my knowledge. Not Obviously not. <laughs> Yes. In a similar context, has there been any uh, explicit recognition of any type of rodeo rodeo events as like actual protected cultural events or institutions in a Canadian sense? Because that is some of the stuff that, like, you know, some very historical stuff in European senses uh, about bull fighting and stuff. Is there anything like that in Canadian senses? Not to my knowledge, no. Yes. Small comment on your chicks. When they hatch, I'm, I'm not a transportation expert, but when chicks hatch, um, they're, they're the yolk, right? So if you have an egg, that, that yellow placenta, the yolk, that becomes your chick. And when they hatch, they have a little bit of that inside of them. So it gives them time, it gives them energy. And it, yeah, it gives them 72 hours. So that might be why they have more time here. And also there's a lot, um, uh, a lot of research into transportation gels, nutrient gels, because you don't want to transport them with water because they might drown. There's what it's called oasis, and you could transport right. them with that. So that might, uh, again, not a transportation expert, but I think that's why you have more time with your chicks. Um, and, and I have a question for you, um, and, and this is about companion animals. So here in Canada and Nova Scotia, for sure, um, we have this overpopulation problem, especially the cats. Um, and, uh, and it's an us versus Europe question. Because uh, I'd like to be like them, but I don't know how to get there. Um, so if you go to Europe, uh, Scandinavia, with your pet, and they find out your your pet is uh, spayed or neutered, you're a monster, right? Because it's not necessary there. So, so for us, that's that's our necessary way of controlling overpopulation. For them, they're able to handle that. So how do how do we compare ourselves to them? Yeah. Like spaying and neutering those. Uh. Well, like you say, we certainly spay and neuter way more than uh, European countries. Um, I don't know that they have handled overpopulation um, the way people might think they have. There are overflowing shelters in, in Europe as well. Um, so I, I can't say that they've got a, a handle on the problem that, that we haven't achieved yet. Overpopulation is a real problem all over North, well, all over the world um, of dogs and cats. Um, I know spay and neuter is taboo in a lot of places in Europe. Uh, how they manage the problem, maybe their shelters have higher euthanasia rates, I don't know. But uh, they have shelters with strays and... So, because it is a painful procedure, but because of it, hopefully we're controlling the population. So, is that considered, same with vaccination, right? Is that considered torture? Or or, or, um, I would say it's necessary. Well, we neuter humans too, so. <laughs> People get it done all the time. I mean, you have to look at, at this standard of care for dogs and cats when you're getting um, um, spayed or neutered. Um, and I should qualify this. I'm a veterinarian. Um, and so those animals, that's an elective surgery. So those animals are given appropriate um, anesthetic and appropriate pain medication. And that's the difference. Well, if you were to neuter your own dog, I think the charges on the criminal code would succeed. So yes, it's an accepted medical practice and also necessary. Okay. <laughs> one, one question, dominating it. So you, you're teaching a course now, a seminar course in animal law. Is there any requirement that the students or any suggestions that the students who take those courses should probably should take courses in biology or animal sciences so that they have a bit more of a background. I mean, so a question which you said the answer, thank you, but which to most animal scientists is, is very well known, and takes quite nicely when they're exactly well known, should be something that a student would know before they would start to make decisions on, on laws related to animals. 
Um, no, there's no science prereq prerequisite for the course. I'm glad to hear that because it explains for me. I still think the numbers are high. I mean, just on a comparative basis with other countries and the way they do things. I mean, it I doesn't mean it's right, but it, it does explain. Sure. Uh, but no, I mean, there's no prerequisites in law school. <laughs> I mean, maybe for certain advanced uh, law classes, but you can go to law school with any kind of degree is what I mean. There's no requirement that you uh, come from a science background or what have you. I don't know why that's funny. It's really very <laughs> to learn about social activities, to learn I would say that the onus is on me to, to bring that, that information. So thank you for explaining the, the 72 hour limit to me. Yeah. There are um, animal scholars, uh, animal rights uh, authors who, who are of the view that anyone who, who does animal law should be up to date on, on the science and who spend time reading scientific journals. And yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because we offer a very nice distance course in Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just as a comment or a corollary to that, also, uh, there's a fair bit of documentation about uh, law, and specifically judges, but lawyers also, um, and the const construction and the conveyance of stats, specifically within legal frameworks, um, and how there could be um, some amount of improvement in being like, hey, how is this a statistic, and then how is it a relevant statistic, and how is that going to stop? Yes. So, we try to be like, hey, law students. I agree with that. More. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. I've written about um, yeah. judges and lawyers, and uh, lawyers, uh, the typical sort of level of knowledge in science and social science, and it is certainly lacking um, among many lawyers. When, when I said there's no prerequisite for law school, what I mean is that you can have any undergrad degree and get into law school and never have taken a science course in your life and be a judge. Certainly, that's important. We do have uh, judicial education programs in Canada. Uh, they're on a voluntary basis because uh, of the principle of judicial independence, but a, a lot of, most judges take, take up the opportunity to, to learn and to learn about you know, quantitative and qualitative research and research methodologies and sciences and they have to know these things in order to, to choose which expert to believe in a, in a battle of experts in the adversarial system. So yes, that's true, 100%. Yes. Yes. Um, are you able to speak at all about uh, how Canada's laws uh, govern or uh, prohibit sexual abuse of animals? Uh, I can. Um, oddly. <laughs> I mentioned uh, that animal justice intervened in a case at the Supreme Court of Canada, and that case was about interpreting the, um, uh, the, well, the term escapes me, but uh, uh, bestiality provision of the criminal code. And the question for the court was whether there needs to be penetration in order for it to constitute the act. And animal justice uh, wanted to argue that there does not, uh, in the interest of the animals, it's animal abuse, regardless of whether or not there's penetration, and uh, they lost. Um, well, they weren't a party, they were an intervener bringing their case, the, the court didn't adopt their reasoning, but the court uh, nevertheless mentioned their arguments, uh, which is significant coming from the Supreme Court of Canada, and I believe that there's a private, a private member's bill uh, from a conservative MP, uh, whose name I can't remember right now, she's from Alberta, uh, but uh, to change the, uh, the wording of the bestiality provision so that that's not required. Yes? What do they define as penetration? Uh, like, is it only by a phallus or is it by object or penetration as well? I don't think they got into those details. Okay. How are your, your provincial and general empires? Uh, you talked about the shutting down and the federal. The reason they go to federal is because you can't ship outside the province. Yes. Yes. Is it potentially affecting the other part only within the province? So if you're going to sh ship of course. or transit outside the province, you have to go there. Of course. The ones in the maritime provinces are the big guy shut down. 
Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, anything that's interprovincial is federal legislation. It's federal jurisdiction. Um, a couple of years ago, I learned recently, though, that uh, there used to be agreements in place between the provinces and the feds for the feds to inspect provincial abattoirs, and the feds stopped doing that. So I imagine that that might have had some effect on their ability to continue carrying on operations as well. Yeah. So in the interest of food safety, you compromised animal welfare. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the interest of, in all human interests, we compromise animal welfare. Yes. Well, like I said, it's always about finding a balance, and right now, the balance uncontroversially tips towards humans. Um, yeah, it's a balance that probably should be rectified. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a short technical question. You mentioned there was a Senate and a House bill, mm. and can, which are on the same subject matter, basically. Can, can two bills coexist, or one will be defeated in the other one cannot, if one was accepted, could the other one also be? They do different things. Oh, they do different things. Yep, the Senate bill uh, changes the criminal code or uses criminal law, criminal jurisdiction. Um, the, the House bill is a fisheries issue. Oh. Um, if there was overlap, then I suppose it might be like a race to the finish, mm -hmm. but uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's any overlap between them. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.